as Mark mentioned, I've known him for nearly 10 years now. I've interviewed him, I don't know how many occasions on the last word, as recently as last week. So some of the questions I'm about to ask him for your benefit are probably questions he's heard me ask him before. I thought you were going to be a light there, man, <laughs> say I've had enough. <laughs> Not at all. I'm always <laughs> fascinated by it. And you know, watching that video, Mark, there was a bit where you're in the exoskeleton and you're walking along on the crutches. How long can you actually do that for? How many minutes are you able to now at this stage actually go along like that? Yeah, so I, 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 could, probably, I could probably keep going all day in the robot because the robot uh, allows for, and it's very important that, that the subject, the patient, the individual can stand uh, and weight bear using my own skeleton. So I'm inside of you standing on my own skeleton. The robot is powering along with uh, motors at the knees and at the, at the hips. But the really exciting bit is the electrical stimulation. I had imagined with all these robotics experts that that robot will eventually turn into, a, you know, we might even see the, the motors implanted in the knee and hip joints. We might see flexible materials that we can sit down and implanted into our clothes. And really it's just a form of movement. What we're really interested in is igniting the nervous system and taking control of the, the damaged nervous system so we can uh, get, get the body working again. Explain that to me a little bit more because just before you get that, how does it feel like to be actually in the suit when you're actually walking? Do you have any sensation of walking? Uh, yeah, and I, I, so I think, I think most, people, um, most people who are paralyzed can still feel tapping, on, say, on the bottom, bottom of our feet through the vibrations through the, ske the, the skeleton. So whenever I'm standing in it, I lean on to my le left side and slightly forward, the right foot automatically takes a step. Onto the right foot, slightly forward, the left leg takes a, a step. So you can, you can feel the heel strike, but my legs still feel, uh, although I can't feel them, they still feel like if the robot gave way, I'd just collapse on, onto the floor. So I feel a little bit like one of those string, you know, the, you used to press the bottom of a doll thing and it would collapse the strings and then when you let go, it, it sort of uh, straightens up. I feel, I feel like without the exoskeleton, I could, I could collapse, but it's about movement, keeping the tendons in order, uh, keeping uh, weight-bearing exercise through the bones. And it really was the first, the first big innovation that allowed people like me to, to stand and walk. And we're talking about 2012. This is like that's like the, you know, the first version of the mobile phone. Uh, I'm looking forward to when we get to the smartphones. You know, <laughs> but the way you're talking, you seem to suggest that almost rather than being encased in this exoskeleton, that it becomes part of you. Mm. It's almost built into you, is it? Yeah, it, it, it is. It is, but it's very much in the in the re rehabilitation context. I get into it now, and uh, I'm walking with someone always holding on behind me. Um, you can't really go outside because there are 52 sensors on each foot, and uh, that that gives uh, the robot the information it needs to interact with its computer, which I wear on my back. Um, and really to, to work in a way that approximates a human, a human gait pattern. So, you know, it's really, really good, but I mean, it's just a, it's, it's just a, a movement device. It's probably not as good as, it, as they could make right now, and they will be better. So it's, it's okay, but a lot of people think still the technology of the wheelchair, you know, going up Grafton Street, you're probably better in a wheelchair than you are in a robot. But the question is, where is that going to be um, in the future? And there's so much money going in to, ro to robotics, as we know, with, the, uh, with all the research that's going on, some of which we've heard about the Googles, uh, DARPA in the, in the States. So we're piggybacking a lot on the back of uh, money that's already flowing into robotics. And are there many other people in your situation who are also in who are investing and experimenting in actually using these exoskeletons or other similar products? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there's a, 
uh, a New Zealand robot, which is really st stable. Um, there's, a, there's a Japanese one. There are a couple, couple in America. But the, one, the reason that, I, that I've gone with Exobionics from San, San Francisco is because where, and I, our scientists in UCLA that we collaborate with, when you join in, the robot dynamically does less. So as I, as I pu push or pull with my legs, the robot knows to do less. And for any sports people, um, which is my background, the training effect is all important. Now, that doesn't matter if you've got a compromised nervous system and you can't actually do anything, which I couldn't do for two years until we got the electrical stimulation. But when I got the electrical stimulation on the spine, that's whenever this variable assist software uh, became very important because I can do more and uh, as I do more, it does less. But there are loads of people walking in robots around the world. Um, there are loads of people having, well, less people being electrically stimulated. Um, I remain, and I started three years ago, I remain the only person to have combined both of these interventions and that's not good enough. So our next 12 people will be the next 12 people who are doing it. We're gonna be the lead center in the world for this combination. But what I'm more excited about is the uh, venture philanthropy fund that we've created $4 million to help commercialize the electrical stimulation device for people. You know, if you're paralyzed from the neck down, you're more interested in your hand working than your leg working. So, um, and they're getting that electrical stimulation on its own is allowing for that uh, hand movement. We know of someone who's paralyzed from the neck down who can take a, the top off of a water bottle, not with any brain interface, but rather using their own nervous system. So this is, you know, what I'm... A, a Sorry, Mark, is that what it spends? It was a remarkable part of the video we just saw mm. where your leg seemed to be moving independently. Yeah. Is that because of the electrical stimulus of the various things attached to your leg? Well, that's the... Uh, important distinction, you know, we, we can directly electrocute muscles and contract them, that's fine, we can do that, we've been able to do it for 30, 30 years and more. The Russian who was electrically stimulating me at the time um, used to be in a USSR, he was an Olympic pentathlete, and uh, they used to put them in, a, in sports camps and electrocute them. <laughs> Him to, to develop the muscles. Now he's he actually fell off his, hor his horse and broke his neck, and he's been developing this technology. He was a, he was directly stimulating my spinal circuitry, not my muscles. And as he as he was stimulating the spinal circuitry, I voluntarily moved my leg, which conventional wisdom says shouldn't be done. So what what we're really focused on? Sorry, is, were you aware of that that your leg moved? Um, I were you told it? Uh, well, Simon, my fiance, told me, and she was disappointed that I wasn't whooping and cheering. But uh, I thought, well, you're not going to be able to do too much if I'm just able to lie on a on a on a bench lifting my knee up. But it, you know, it's it's revolutionary that we can yes. do that. The question is, where can we get to, and how can we get it? You know, we hear brilliant stories of research all the time. Big brains. We've met loads of them all around the world, and they're they're here in the room. The question is. When the research gets to a point where it can be useful, how do we get it out, commercialize it, get across what I understand is the valley of death, because most people fail when they try and commercialize? How do we get up to the point where the fountains of this world and the Presidio partners in the States and, and uh, the other funds, the growth fund in Atlantic Bridge, grab hold of it and it's de-risked? The technology is de-risked so that people can start to make a return and this is the space where, where I think there's a big challenge. We've got brilliant researchers. There's loads of money in the system, but how do we make this jump from research to commercial products that impact people? And that, that's sort of the space where we're starting uh, to try and formalize what we're doing to but help the scientists. It strikes me, Mark, though, you're an absolutely brilliant salesman because you've been able to persuade so many people to invest in this. Well, they all, you see, I'm interested because I speak on behalf of the patients. The robotics guys want to sell robots. The electrical stimulation people want to get their research commercialized, recognized for that, 
eventually make money. The foundations, they're in the business of supporting this type of research. VCs, they're in the business of getting a return. Family offices, in their uh, range of investments, some want big returns, some are happy enough with smaller returns, venture philanthropy. So everyone that we're working with is getting something out of it. And we need to make sure that the patients who don't have access to it get something out of it. So we, I always go back to a quote by, um, uh, from Viktor Frankl's book and uh, Friedrich Nietzsche is the philosopher, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. The understanding, if you, if you know why you're doing what you're doing, you can put up with the tough stuff. And we just keep reminding the, v, the VCs and all our scientists and all our partners, you know, why are we actually doing this stuff in the first place? You know, it's difficult, it's hard, there is no answer, it's complicated. But in fact, you're trying to, if you're trying to make a difference and you remind people of that, well, they can find a way, but every, everyone, everyone's got to win. One thing that struck me as well when we saw the video of you going to the South Pole, people talk about exploring and going to the South Pole. It struck me, you very much explored what you were able to do yourself. Mm. And you actually have managed, I mean, I, I can't imagine the majority of people to have taken the setbacks that you've taken in life to have maintained such a determined, positive attitude. How do you actually manage that? How do you actually manage to maintain that focus and that discipline and the ambition as well? Um, I, I think I, you know, I, I really do think sp sport for me taught me how to how to win and how to lose, and more particularly, when you've either won or lost, how to put it behind you and get, get moving forward. So I think I was practicing from a very young age how to face up to things and then move on from them. And, you know, I've also spent two periods in my life lying in bed, and if you're not doing stuff that's interesting and exciting, the bad stuff uh, is 100% of your life. So, you know, if you take paralysis out of it, the accident, the nearly dying, uh, the wheelchair and so on over the last seven years, it has been the most fulfilling, the most interesting, the most exciting time of my life. Now, if I couldn't, if I could turn the back of the clock and not fall out the window and not be paralyzed, I'd do that first. But it has been fascinating and it's becoming even more exciting as we get to this next stage of the of the adventure but uh you know i'd if I, I have the option of lying in bed but i think it would be a bad one because i got twenty eight thousand people running and run in the dark this um november i got you support. know I, I asked a question of them earlier how many people here had run uh, previous years <laughs> and we got a handful of hands up how many of you will run <laughs> this year and run for the dark for us please <laughs> Okay, much better response that time, Mark. I think nearly half of them said they'll do the run this year. Do we have lie detectors on anyone? <laughs> yeah. We shame them into it. Yeah, yeah. But look, I, you know, from my, I'm lucky. I, I, I'm lucky in terms of the support that I've had, the experiences I've had in the past. Um, but there are people right now in the National Rehab Hospital who can't get out, who don't have visitors, who don't have sport, uh, support, who don't have the prospects and have no access to this amazing technology, uh, which is why I'm so exercised about, you know, we've got to have self-interest. I'm really keen to fix myself, but if we don't fix me, I, I know that I and the team will have contributed to something pretty exciting in this, in this field of research. So, and it's why I was absolutely delighted to get the opportunity to, and to even hear that this event exists because you know, research for research sake is, you know, we probably need all, all that, but only because it eventually leads to something exciting and it leads to all these people in the room who are about to get out of the lab and commercialized. Mark Pollock, thank you very much for being with us today.